today I'm not going to talk about um, Stanford or, or Bits and Watts, and I'm not talk, going to talk about Gizmo, because I know that other people are going to do that during this week. So, uh, so I'm going to, and I'm not going to talk about great innovations, because I think you've had, you will be hearing a lot of uh, overview of vision and things like that. What I want to talk about is a specific area of grid innovation and uh, what we do here at Stanford and Slack. To, and I want to expose you to a lot of things that we're doing so that you can think about when you start your own research, the types of things that you can, you can do with us, with the Stanford faculty and the Slack uh, scientists. All right, so just one slide on Bits and Watts and Gizmo. Uh, Gizmo is a group of about 15 uh, scientists and students and postdocs uh, up on the hill. You're going to visit the Gizmo lab uh, if we have electricity uh, on Friday because we're going through a renovation. Uh, and then there's a, another lab here at Stanford called Bits and Watts. It has been under construction over the last year. We're expecting to, to open it in November. So there is a hands-on, uh, both places have really good hands-on facilities to, for you to do your research. Um, let me talk a little bit about modeling uh, and data-driven modeling. We know as engineers, you probably have been exposed to modeling <laughs> using, uh, describing really um, physical phenomena using math. Uh, that's what we typically do uh, in engineering. But there are other really complex phenomena that we can't necessarily describe with um, math. And what the interesting thing is, you, when these two phenomena, the behavioral phenomena and the physical phenomena come together, that it becomes even more complex to actually model. So, uh, and we know that data-driven uh, modeling has been very successful in these areas. We use tools. We use technologies that use data-driven modeling every day. And there has been significant advances in, in certain areas, but not necessarily in electricity. Um, but there are a lot of en enabling technologies. And today, this is a um, Project Sunroof from Google. What they do is you enter your address, and it calculates what kind of solar PV potential your roof has, it calculates all the, um, also the, the shadows uh, and things like that, and gives you more or less an equivalent generation for your home. And also, they sell you some ads at the bottom. So if you want to buy your um, you know, solar cells from any of the providers below, you can go and call them up and get prices. Imagine using this technology not for selling rooftop solar, but trying to figure out what the potential of rooftop solar in a distribution area is and how that distribution, how that generation can impact your distribution network, or if there's a solar eclipse, what that impact is going to be on that local distribution network. So there are a lot of tools that we can sort of think about bringing to the distribution and transmission system planning and operations. Uh, there's also a lot of things that are happening in the machine learning applications on the power system side. Um, topology detection t tends to be a very difficult task for a lot of uh, utilities because they don't have recent data. It's very difficult to figure for them to figure out which meters are hooked up to which feeder is using which switches. So we can actually uh, use machine learning on power systems to, to uh, actually extract the topology of a distribution network as well. Um, and this is a really great time to sort of take machine learning or other applic data-driven applications and marry them with power systems. Power systems is a very traditional uh, field that comes with really heavy electrical engineering uh, folks. Uh, and, and there is a gap between those hardware-driven electrical engineering folks and this new technology. And this is what we're trying to bridge here. Uh, there's growing awareness to digitalization. Any kind of a company that you go and talk with have a digitalized or digitalization um, group within their company. Uh, there's a lot of data availability. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, there's, there's plenty of cheap storage now. Um, widely available platforms like Google Cloud, AWS, Microsoft Azure. Uh, there's plenty of advances in data science and other fields that we can think about applying into the power systems. And then also advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence that we haven't really scratched the surface in the power systems world. So let me talk a little bit about the data. There is plenty of data and there isn't. Uh, the reason for that is that some of this data is proprietary and some of it is uh, 
kept proprietary because of the privacy and security concerns. So that one area that we need to really focus is how to overcome these security and privacy er, uh, issues. But on the power system, uh, there, are about there are many synchrophasers on the transmission uh, system. These are sensors that do sampling of the electricity system every 100, uh, 120 uh, samples per second. There are microsynchrophasers on the dis distribution system, and they are uh, also working as a synchrophasers. In, in the west area, the western interconnect area, we have about 300 um, synchrophasers. About 75 of those are in California. Um, Synch microsynchrophasers are new technologies that are just being put on the distribution network. And there are plenty of line sensors that uh, provide data back into utility um, SCADA systems. In buildings and distributed energy resources, we've had interval meters uh, in, um, in California for buildings over 200 kW and above for many, many years, since 2003, I believe. We've had smart meters uh, starting 2009, 2010 time frame. We have a lot of trend logs from buildings that we are not utilizing today, but they're there for us to be uh, use, using. Um, then there's the mobility area where there's a lot of charging session information from a lot of charging vendors. There's a lot of driving patterns that the cars are co right now uh, compiling, and some of the OEMs already have information on that. So what we're not doing is we're not doing pure mobility, pure power systems, and pure buildings and DER work. What we're doing is really looking at the intersection, building to grid transactions, vehicle to building transactions, vehicle to grid sort of uh, uh, concepts. There's, these concepts include technology development, market transformation, and regulatory, uh, understanding the regulatory framework, and sometimes really changing that framework as well. So it's a very sophisticated um, area, because if your technology is good, you're not going to make an impact if you don't understand its value in the marketplace or the regulatory context that it's going to uh, part, uh, be working in. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the, I guess, five projects that we have uh, currently, either starting or wrapping up just to give you an overview of what we're doing in terms of machine learning and power systems. Um, so VISM, Vader, PowerNet, Script, and GRIP. We like acronyms, you can, you can tell. And we tried to come up with some catchy acronyms. They're all uh, acronyms for a reason. I'll, I'll walk you through them. So VISM stands for Visualization Insight System for De Demand Operations and Management. This was an RPE, DOE RPE funded project where uh, Dr. Ram Rajagopal received about 1 million customer data, only uh, used about, I believe, 100 to 200,000 customer data within pg &E's territory, which is this territory, and uh, build a way to, for the, for the uh, utility to design and evaluate their pro uh, uh, programs. These programs are energy efficiency programs, demand response programs. As a utility, you want to approach your customers that have the most potential. So with a 20% sort of approach, you get 80% of the yield, right? These kinds of tools allow uh, the utility to uh, understand their customers, understand their consumption patterns, cluster different customer groups in different locations, and really provide services that will provide the best yield. Um, the uh, tool is available and being used by utilities right now in California. It has data cleansing and management capability, uh, demand future extraction, targeting, segmentations. These are very valuable to the utilities, obviously. Response models, how fast, um, how steady the response is being provided. Uh, measurement verification capabilities for energy efficiency programs and forecasting and pricing capabilities. And there are lots of companies who have been involved over the life of this project and continue to take this a concept from Stanford up into their products and add, uh, add additional features to it. The other project is called Vader, Visualization Analytics of Distributed Energy Resources. Here the idea is that what if we have all this data, uh, can we actually start using all this data to better plan and operate the electricity grid? Now, Vader doesn't go as far as operating the electricity grid, it's all about planning, it's a planning tool. Uh, but the idea is that we need an infrastructure to handle all those data, set, data that's coming from disparate resources. Once we have the infrastructure, we need to develop a user and developer group that can easily use and develop, use this data uh, and 
visualization and insights extracted from the data and a developer group that can potentially continue to uh, maintain this, these analytics and grow the capabilities. And in the end, we want to look at what if and what now. What is happening right now on the grid? Uh, create some situational awareness. And then what if? What if things change over time? What would be the impact on the electricity grid? And how do we plan for a future when things change? Um, I won't go into the details, but just so you know, the data that we are receiving is coming into different formats, different time series stamps. They're missing data. It can get really messy. One of the big problems is how do you ingest this data and how do you actually clean it and how do you use it for different analytics? And different analytics have different uses or diff need different data sets. So how do you actually condition the data to fit into the analytics that you want to use? So those are important pieces that we're adding. Um, just one example of the analytics. This is a, a situational awareness uh, capability, but also has an impact on the utility bottom line. Monitoring each switch is very expensive, but the utilities would love to monitor each switch so that they know at any given time what the switch condition is. Uh, what we're doing is we are taking a, uh, a system like this. Uh, these are all switches. The circles are switches. Instead of monitoring each switch, the orange circles around, uh, the black ones are sensors. Um, so there are open switches and closed switches and circles are sensors. We're saying instead of uh, monitoring each switch, let's do a subset. In this case, we're monitoring four out of 10 and see what the limits of reconfiguring the, the network based on the switch configuration. So we have been very successful this, with this kind of analytic, a, a, analytics and we can recreate the um, system fairly accurately even if there are delays in the system. And there are papers that show this as well. Um, the other project Probably Dr. Ram Rajagopal is going to talk to you about this project, but uh, we have an RPE uh, with Stanford, between Stanford and Slack where we're looking at developing three types of technologies. A smart infuse at the home that operates at these time scales, a home hub, a gateway device in the home that can, communicates with the smart dim, dimming fuse and all the appliances, and then a cloud coordinator somewhere in the cloud that communicates with the variety of home hubs. So when we get a signal from an independent system operator saying move your resources this way or that way, it comes to the cloud coordinator. The cloud coordinator sends uh, instructions to the home hub, and then the home hub sends instructions to all of the connected devices. So this is a project, a three-year project. We're almost uh, done with a three quarters of uh, the project, so it's fairly new, and there's a lot of uh, potential to get involved. Uh, script. Again, another acronym, uh, Smart Charging Infrastructure Planning Tool. Here the idea is that should we actually plan for a charging infrastructure that is just enough for, to, to maintain the charging of the cars? Or should we actually build out this infrastructure a little bit more so that there's some flexibility and we can utilize that flexibility for the grid um, uh, transactions? So this project is looking at that. It's funded by the California Energy Commission. Um, while we're going to do a lot of forecasting and charging, creating user interfaces using a platform, doing a demonstration, we're also looking at uh, benefits and cost analysis of this kind of uh, um, trade-off. This one doesn't have an acronym, so we failed, but um, I'm going to work on this one. Uh, but the, here the idea is that we have two locations that we want to show the impact of smart charging on the distribution transformers. So we know that charging impacts the distribution network and the distribution transformer. Actually, we don't know how much, or so what we want to do is actually get a baseline first. And then once we get a baseline, start implementing smart charging algorithms to uh, show their impact on the, uh, and reduce their impact on the transmission network. So two locations, we have Stanford and we have Google Campus in Mountain View with 900 AVSCs that we're going to be working with. And Google's going to do a one month test with us, which we're really excited, uh, excited about because we don't get to do these large scale tests very often with companies like Google. Uh, my last slide is GRIP. Uh, GRIP stands for Grid Resilience and Intelligence Platform. Here, we're, I'm not going to go into detail because I have a lot of, uh, I don't have a lot of time actually, but we're going to do an anticipation analytics using um, data from, again, disparate resources. But here the idea is to build predictive analytics and think about 
what are the vulnerabilities on the grid? What are the vulnerabilities if it's a heat, heat wave event, if it's a flood event, if it's a, another extreme weather uh, event, or if it's a cybersecurity event? And then once the event happens, can we absorb this and ride through the event with controlling devices in the field? And then once the event happens and the lights are out, how fast can we recover uh, from those events? So we're going to be uh, building a platform with Google X, uh, absorb, look, demonstrate the absorption with um, Vermont, and then recover from events with a utility in the midst, small utility in the Midwest using the distributed energy resources. My last slide, actually. Um, final works. There's lots of exciting work that's going on, and I would encourage you to get involved. Uh, come to the Smart Grid seminars. We will have them every Thursday. Uh, and then we have Thursday happy hours, so come to the Thursday happy hours. Um, and beware of the uh, funding opportunities. Bits and Watts has seed grants that you can uh, talk with your professors about. And then fellowships. So uh, talk to your professors, tap into those resources. If you want to be a um, part of the Bits and Watts mailing list, please uh, send an email to John. If you want to be a part of the Gizmo student list, send an email to me. We'd be happy to do this. After every talk that I give, I get about 20 students who come. And I have the first year I had meetings with each 20 student. This year, I'm not doing that. Go start your semester. Think about the workload you have. I know these are all really exciting and you want to do something right away, but take, take a, you know, go through the first six weeks of your uh, classes and then let's talk and uh, I'd be happy to, <laughs> I'd be happy to uh, work with you and get you more involved in any of the projects that we have. Great. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Got a couple minutes for questions, and so rather than waiting six months or six weeks, you can ask, yes, ask a few questions. Yes, you can ask now. as many questions as you want. Uh, I'd be happy to answer them on e with e email to, through email, too. But um, as I said, go ahead. There are a lot of small microgrids uh, that, you know, people have named them nanogrids even. So everyone's definition of microgrids is different. You can have a small system where you have a solar charger in your backpack and a little uh, battery in your backpack that charges your phone. That's a microgrid. Anything that's disconnected from the grid is called, can be islanded from the grid. It's called a microgrid, right? So you can create these microgrids as small as a backpack that charges your phone as big as a huge industrial microgrid. But there are lots of examples of it, and everyone's definition changes. The only requirement is that you're eager to learn and work hard. We'll teach you everything else. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Does the grid heat system where uh, the solar panels uh, mounted on the rooftop of houses actually heats the grid uh, also form the part of the new grid that we are trying to build up? Yes. So distributed energy resources like the P solar PV uh, is a huge part of the disruptive part of the system, right? Um, you, people buy and put it on their rooftops, and utilities have no idea uh, who installs them how much it is in terms of the generation cap capacity. It's very difficult for them to incorporate them into their planning. So some of the things that we do is, for example, solar disaggregation. <coughs> Which customers have how much solar generation using data analytics? Uh, well, some of these uh, switches are, well, it's not the switches, but it's a switch and a sensor combination. Com uh, putting the sensors is uh, expensive. And if the switch doesn't come with the sensor, which is a, the old switches, then you have to actually disrupt the system and put the sensor, because these switches are not like your you know, uh, CTs and PTs. You have to actually cut the power to be able to uh, hook them up. So that, that adds to the cost, labor and downtime. Uh, 
Uh, well, the biggest questions in my mind on demand response are not technical questions. Um, I think the value of demand response going forward is a big question, and that's why a lot of companies are not investing in, a lot in demand response. Um, I think the technology in terms of automation, in terms of integration, are there. Um, the, one of the biggest barriers is that it hasn't, demand response hasn't been oper operationalized in the distribution system. Uh, so that is the biggest, biggest problem. When you don't operationalize it, you don't know the value, you don't know how to use it, you don't trust those resources, that's, that's uh, the biggest barrier. Yeah, so Wisdom is something that the utilities are implementing. Vader is something we're working with the Southern California Edison on, and they're planning to implement it. That's why they were really excited about the GRIP project, but because it allows them to embed some of these capabilities. Um, I think we're very new. Vader's only about a year and a half old. Uh, GRIP hasn't started. So by the time we're done with our projects, we, we think that there's going to be a lot of uh, embedded uh, capabilities. And our ECA, which is our, one of our biggest supporters in the GRIP project, has about 900 utilities. So they provide these kinds of services uh, to them, and I think the impact is going to be huge. Great. Well, please join me in thanking Seller once again.